Documentaries give us a window into our world. They can take us on a journey to the furthest reaches of our planet, or navigate the strange relationships between professional gamers. They can put us in the shoes of a murderer, or lead us through the complex ethics of the global agricultural industry. They present a dramatized reality with the idea of uncovering some subjective truth by selecting images and stories that tell us something about our world. And perhaps the best example of this is the first feature length documentary, Nanook of the North from 1922. Hello and welcome to 100 Years of Cinema. We'll be taking a look at at least one film a year from 1915 to track the evolution of film over the last century. In 1910, Robert Flaherty was hired as a railroad prospector to explore the East Hudson Bay, an area around the size of England with a population of roughly 300 native Inuits. In 1915, Flaherty started filming the lives of Inuit people. After accidentally burning the first draft of his film, he decided to reshoot in 1920, this time focusing on one man, Nanook and his family. And although he didn't know it at the time, he was creating the conventions of the modern documentary. Most films that were made immediately after the invention of the film camera, between 1890 and 1910, focused on capturing small slices of life, called actualities. These first films introduced the idea of the passive camera, placing the camera in front of a boxing match or workers leaving a factory, and recording the results without influence of the filmmaker. When Flaherty started filming what would become the world's first feature-length documentary, he took this idea and he expanded it arranging images and stories taken from what was seemingly a passive camera to construct a narrative that told us something larger about the Inuit community and how they lived. The film was an immediate hit, both in the US and abroad, but it also came under heavy criticism. Although the film was presented as an unmediated window into the Inuit community, the reality is that most of the film's sequences were constructed and staged by Flaherty. In real life, Nanook was called Alakagi Alak, and Nanook's wife in the film was really Flaherty's common law wife. The film shows Nanook and his family constructing a real igloo, but Flaherty's 60 pound hand cranked camera was far too big to fit inside and it would have been impossible to film without lights. To fix this, Flaherty had the Inuits construct a large three walled temporary igloo to fit in his camera and allow natural lighting for filming. They then pretended to bed down for the night and go to sleep. But Flaherty's influence on the film went beyond just making it easy to capture. Flaherty wanted to preserve the rapidly disappearing culture of the Inuit from before when they came into contact with Western man. But by this time, the Inuits were already familiar with Western culture. Most had traded in their native furs for Western clothes and their harpoons for guns. So when it came time for Nanook to hunt a walrus, Flaherty had him hunt with a traditional harpoon instead of the more standard rifle he was used to using. Although in one sense the film was staged, it was still a real walrus being hunted with a real harpoon built in the traditional Inuit way. Another example of staging is in the scene in which Nanook takes seal furs to a trading post. The trader shows Nanook how he cans a man's voice with a gramophone. Nanook leans in to get a closer look and tries to take a bite out of a record. At this time, Nanook had been trading with white people for years and he was well aware of what a gramophone was. Although many scenes were captured under instruction for Flaherty, what happened on camera were real events that depicted authentic details of Inuit life and it's easy to think that the staged nature of Nanook of the North reduces its value as a documentary, but it was in this way he forged the path to the documentary we have today. In the 1950s and 60s, two new kinds of documentaries emerged inspired by Flaherty's work, the first called direct cinema, shortly followed by cinema verite, or observational cinema. They shared the idea that in a documentary, both the audience and the subject should be unaware of the camera's presence. The films are normally shown as a sequence of shots without voiceover or context. The difference being that cinema verite allowed the filmmaker to interact with its subject, while direct cinema does not. A perfect example of cinema verite is Grey Gardens from 1975, which attempted to chronicle the life of two aging socialites that live alone in a dilapidated house. Cinema verite and direct cinema both employ fly on the wall style filmmaking to try and uncover an objective truth. They are a filmmaker's attempt to replicate reality on film. But you can never truly capture objective reality. Every edit the filmmaker makes, every choice of shot, even the choice of story, goes toward constructing a subjective narrative. Even the simple presence of a camera breaks the reality. These films may be non-fiction, but they're no more true than the works of Robert Flaherty. Thanks for watching 100 Years of Cinema. What do you think? Can a film ever truly capture objective reality? Let me know in the comments below. 
and be sure to subscribe so we can travel through the history of film together.